morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's WEIM Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancements Phase 2 Stakeholder Call. This morning, we'll be discussing the draft tariff language for this initiative. My name is Isabella Nicosia, representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'll be facilitating the web conference today. I'm also joined on the line by John Anders, our Assistant General Counsel in our legal department here at the ISO. The draft tariff language is available out on the ISO website, and you can get to it by going to kaiso.com. And then you'll want to go to the Stay Informed tab, go down to Policy Initiatives. That'll take you to the main landing page. And then all the way at the bottom of the page, you'll find the WEIM Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancements page link. You'll click that, and it'll be one of the top documents on that page. So before we get started, I just have a couple housekeeping reminders. Uh, this call is being recorded. The re recording is for informational and convenience purposes only. Any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. If you run into any technical difficulties during today's call, you can send a chat to the event producer. Her name is Candice. So the agenda for today, I'm just going to go through the stakeholder process very briefly, and then I'll hand it over to John to walk through the draft tariff language, and we'll wrap up today with some next steps. So this slide here shows where we are at in the California ISO stakeholder uh, process. So we're still here under proposal development, uh, but we're here at the draft tariff and business practice manual revision stage, um, and then still uh, targeting and implementation of uh, June 1, 2023. So with that, Isabella, I, we're in the, the slides advance. You're still on the cover slide, just, just so you know. Thanks for that, John. <laughs> this is the slide I am talking about. We are here at the stakeholder process um, right here under proposal development um, at the draft tariff stage and then implementation over on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, that's still targeted for June 1, 2023. So with that, I'm going to pull up the uh, draft tariff language, and then I will hand it over to John. So let me pull that up. All right. Well, Isabella, appreciate that introduction, and I uh, appreciate everybody joining us this morning. Um, just, you know, for context here, uh, publish the draft final proposal for this initiative, the WAM Resource Efficiency Enhancements uh, Phase 2. Um, and I think comments are uh, due here in another week or two, um, maybe maybe sooner than that. I can't, I, I, we'll go over the dates in a minute. I don't have them all all in my head right now, but, um, but this call we did publish uh, draft tariff language and then we do have a subsequent comment date. So this language is a reflection of the proposal, um, the draft final proposal and the elements in that. And uh, in, 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 in that document or in that proposal, there were basically three elements of, uh, of the proposal, uh, two, maybe two depending on how you associate them and account for them, but in any event, um, that required tariff support. So, uh, the 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 two or the two main groups are number one the sort of energy assistance transfer proposal so this is basically the proposal that would allow um, uh, balancing authorities in the WEIM that are that are short in the resource efficiency to um, opt into um, uh, an energy assistance transfer. Um, uh, option and, and, and then that they could receive uh, from other willing uh, WEI and balancing authorities transfer energy um, at, a, at, a, at a predetermined or specified price and we'll go through that. So that's one big one. The other one is really, um, it's, it's different, but it's about how to account for um, uh, low priority uh, exports um, that may be curtailed within the, the operating time frame within the resource efficiency evaluation, and then also uh, some <clears throat> supporting clarity in the, in the ISO tariff about uh, operators' um, implementation of those uh, curtailments in the real time. So we'll go through these, um, and we'll just do it in, in order of the tariff. It, it's not perfectly 
uh, aligned, you know, or grouped, if you will, by topic. So bear with us. Um, and and the, the goal here is just to walk you through the tariff, give you a sense of what's there so that your comments can be more informed and also give you the opportunity to ask questions now um, <clears throat> so that we can we can think about that or 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 or, or share any any clarity we have at this point in time with you. So um, <clears throat> on the screen here is a is what will be or would be a new section of uh, section 29.11, which is the settlements and billing provisions for the WEIM. And, and this would account for the energy uh, assistance uh, transfer revenue. And we'll get to how the revenue is, 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 is generated um, and determined and the, all of that um, in, in, in a moment. But for, for here, uh, just because of the numbering uh, uh, in the tariff, the 2911 appears first. So we have the um, energy assistant transfer revenue and essentially, the, here we're providing for how it's calculated. And I'm, I, you're gonna have to forgive me. I can't, I can't see the, the the words on my screen. And you'll have a chance to read them and 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 consider whether or not they align with what was uh, proposed in the draft final. But uh, we're basically laying out here how we're gonna calculate the 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 revenue, and then how we're gonna allocate the revenue amongst the balancing authority areas, and then how we're gonna, you know, distribute it um, uh, from, from there. So that's, that's the settlement um, section. And, and like I said, I, I'm not gonna read through this language or dive into the details, but in, in essence, um, this is a reflection of the draft final proposal and in, in, in terms of the energy assistance uh, revenue um, calculation, allocation, and distribution. So, uh, yeah. Hey, hey, John. Hey, this is Brad ahead, Cooper. Brad. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, you know, right after we uh, put out the draft final, uh, then subsequently, well, right after the stakeholder meeting, we put out a revised draft final uh, that that made one change to the uh, how we would calculate. The RC obligations for the Cal ISO, and I don't think that's reflected in this. So just so people don't get confused, you know, we did make that one refinement that's probably not in here. Okay, Brad, that that's helpful. Is there is there? Can you just illustrate that for us or explain that for us? So oh, it's I'm, just it, it's just you know we're proposing not to, you know in the draft final we propose to not count. Um, um, uh, LPT exports in the RFC, and we revise that to uh, to just not count real time LPT exports or those newly scheduled and has been, and but count day ahead LPT exports. So that's I I, I don't think that that changes in here. It, it nothing to do with the uh, uh, with the uh, assistance energy. Right. Okay. That that that's helpful too. Yeah. That. We'll get to that in just a minute. The the LPT export accounting in the in the resource efficiency evaluation. So, uh, but here for now we're just focusing on that first element, the the uh, energy transfer assistance, and 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 here is the settlement, you know, the mechanics of the of the settlement calculation, allocation, and distribution of the revenues associated with those energy assistance transfers. So. I think next, if we scroll down, we're going to come uh, to the uh, LPT export. So, as well, if you just kind of roll through until you see a red line, um, you'll see one coming up here. Um, there you go. So, uh, this is the uh, what Brad was just mentioning: the uh, LPT export accounting uh, in the RSE, and and there's two dimensions to this. One is uh, in the capacity test for the KISO balancing authority area, how those LPT exports are accounted. And that is what you're seeing here. And you'll see that the, the, the determination of whether there are LPT exports that are 
uh, you know, sort of curtailed according to the ISO's authority is referenced in the section where that, that operational uh, sort of market uh, dimension is discussed, and, and that's this cross-section reference here. Um, so we'll, um, we'll get to the, the, the substance uh, of that in, in a minute, but for, for now, we're in the um, resource efficiency evaluation, how that's accounted for in the resource efficiency and essentially in the capacity test. Um, and, and again, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's accounted for here. And Isabella, if you scroll down just a little bit further, and you'll see in the flexibility test, it's also accounted for very similarly, but uh, a little bit differently because uh, one is accounting for capacity and the other is accounting for flexibility. So here is a reflection of uh, the, the, the accounting of those low priority exports in the flexibility test. And Brad, I, I don't know if if what you were saying earlier would would be reflected in a change to either one of these two sections here, but we'll catch this tariff up with the revised, uh, the revision that you mentioned. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, it would say something like provided uh, half lower priority export schedules, if, you know, if that captures it. Yeah, we, we got to think of the exact wording because has also included those originally scheduled in the day ahead. But just, you know, like this language right here, it, the intent would be that, you know, just lower priority export schedules that were cleared in HASP aren't included. Cleared in the HASP only. Yeah, excluding the ones. Right. Exactly, you're excluding the ones that originally scheduled day ahead or however you want to phrase it. Okay. All right, good, that's helpful. At least we um, associated that clarification with uh, this tariff section here in the flexible ramping uh, uh, sufficiency evaluation. Okay, so we're kind of jumping around a little bit. So we went from the uh, assistance energy transfers, energy uh, assistance transfer uh, over to the low priority um, export accounting. Uh, and, and so let's let's keep going, and we'll scroll down. And I think at the end of this section, there'll be a, a new section where we're going to get in back into the. And those blue shadings, um, by the way, are just uh, that's to let us know that that's pending tariff language in the flexible ramping product uh, uh, tariff amendment filing that was submitted um, in August, I believe it was. Uh, but that's a pending clarification that was submitted in, in, in the FRP uh, proposal. Um, keep going, Isabella, and I think we'll get to a, the, 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 the main provision on energy assistance transfers. Uh, and here, um, it is sort of, this is how, how it works. And so essentially what happens is this this new section is associated with the consequences for failure of, of either the, the flexibility or capacity tests. And so in, in addition to, you know, just those consequences for failure, there's an option here to opt into this energy assistance transfer. Um, and if, you, if, an, if a balancing area opts, opts into this, then these provisions would apply in, instead of the, the conse other consequences for failure because these uh, BAAs would be given an opportunity to cure um, any shortfalls uh, through this uh, energy assistance transfer mechanism. And so that's just sort of the general uh, principle at the top there. And uh, scroll down a little bit further, Isabella, to the subsection uh, B. And so, in here, uh, we're just describing more of the mechanics of, of what happens uh, in, in if, a, if a BAA opts into the, this. Um, I guess I should mention that the, the CAISO, I do believe, is elected to opt in from the beginning, so we'll be, we'll be, we'll be uh, 
accounting for our resource efficiency, uh, you know, from the outset without making some kind of an election or, or option in to this uh, this proposal. But the the mechanics are laid out here in these little sub sub bullets, and uh, essentially um, it, it it describes what the entity would be subject to. And, and how the optimization would uh, account for these transfers. Uh, scroll down a little bit. And so it would exhaust all available balancing capacity first, and then it would uh, avail uh, uh, itself and, and enable or support the transfers into the, the balancing authority area, the deficient balancing authority area, and it would establish a, a price that's set at the, I think it's the soft offer cap, whichever is applicable, the thousand or two thousand dollar price, according to the tariff. And then uh, what would what would end up happening is the um, <clears throat> uh, the, the the transfers would 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 be supported, and uh, that price would would be applicable to to those quantities of of energy that was transferred. And uh, and 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 then I'm not going to look for it yet. Yep. Then it did shows how we calculate the quantities and uh, and the pricing and and essentially it's utilizing the uh, those prices as the transfer schedule cost, which is a a provision that accounts for energy transfers in the in the WEIM. And it normally does so at a penny, and it's only set at a penny, the parameter at a penny, in order to determine the most efficient and economic you know, flow pattern of those transfers. And so you can allocate the transfers to different interties. But when you set those uh, or that parameter into the BAA that's deficient at these uh, thousand or two thousand dollar prices, then of course it would it would uh, account for them at a much higher cost, and those in transfers sinking into that BAA would then be uh, accounted for and the revenues uh, collected accordingly and settled according to the provision we went over uh, just a few minutes ago. So I think that's mostly it for this energy assistance transfer um, proposal. If you scroll down to the end, Isabella, of this, I think, yep, we're there. So I'm going to pause for a minute now since we've covered energy assistance transfers and see if we have any questions um, in the queue or from anybody on online. Yeah, so I see Alva is in the queue. Let's go to Alva. Hi, can you hear me on, on the phone? Um, yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good, good. I'm, I'm connected by the phone. So um, just to, one question I had uh, is, is there, a, uh, is the case in which, so basically uh, the energy assistance is being provided automatically by the rest of the market. By default, everything that's available is going into that, uh, creating those transfers, as I understand it from this language. Um, if that is not sufficient, what is, does that need to, does that, Case need to be uh, defined in any way. In other words, if you aren't able to cure the deficiency, but you've used up all available transfers, what is the, that situation? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm only bringing it up because this is our last chance to bring these kinds of things up. So I'm just just curious whether that is something a, a, a case that needs to be dealt with in this context. Okay, and I'll I'll, I'll ask Danny to help me out here, but. My understanding is that because we're now in to the real time, right? So we're beyond the resource efficiency time frame. So you've opted into the the energy assistance uh, uh, transfer. So you're 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 saying I'm willing to pay these prices if I have insufficient capacity, right, or flexibility, and then in the real time. If if you didn't pass, instead of freezing your transfers, we would um, implement this this proposal and and uh, the pricing parameters accordingly, and any of the shortfall that was needed to be filled would be at those at those uh, at those high prices. 
um, but you don't revert back. So if you if that's just not enough, right? Not enough uh, energy right. to to meet the needs. It's a real time operational uh, event um, at that point, and and I think Danny's going to help me out here and, and fill in the details of how that might play out. Thanks. Yeah, Go ahead. Sure. Sure, John. So if the EIM is unable to resolve the shortfall, then the prices would be administratively set through relaxing the power balance constraint as described in the proposal at the, at the new relaxation parameters. And then essentially what happens today where a BAA has to try to engage in bilateral emergency energy assistance or access their outside of the market emergency type programs like for California, that would be some of our like ELRP or uh, emergency procured resources would then commence. Okay, so, they so this is just before the, that step. Yeah, yeah hey, hey, this is the category of having failed the, the test and whatever the consequences are now, even though they've brought that amount of transfer in, they still have failed the test and, and every all the current uh, machinery built around that goes into effect. Yeah, yes, this is this is Brad, this is Brad Cooper. So one element of our proposal is that for this to work is that for a uh, BAA that's um, elected to receive energy assistance in an interval that they fail the RFC, their power balance constraint penalty price needs to be doubled. So you know when the bid cap is a thousand you know, the extra cost added on to the um, energy assistance transfers is also a thousand. So, you know, if the marginal cost to supply outside the ISO is $501, then the energy assistance will be $1,501. And then if it's not sufficient, then the power balance constraint will be relaxed at $2,000. And I, I'm bringing that up to just to clarify the approach, but also to double check that we captured that in the tariff. I'm not remembering whether we modified that section about the power balance constraint penalty price or not. Yeah, and just I think to, I thought we did, sorry, but we to, can go back up a little bit, Isabella, and it should be in these uh, four uh, sub bullets right there. Yeah. Maybe we didn't, Brad, but we'll. I still connected. It looks like you froze there. I'm able to hear you, Alva. I think John okay. may be having audio difficulties. Okay. Are you there, so Danny, I'll just... Yeah, I was saying it's it's right there in in IV. Yeah. Right. Um, and just to double check then, so basically, this is a way to cure as much as possible of your deficiency, and that that curing remains in place even if you fail, essentially. So. Um, those transfers become part of your uh, balance of supply and demand as a deficient BAA, even though you failed. And at that point, you have to take the other steps that are defined in the tariff for what happens when you fail. Yes. Yes, that's a good summary, Alba. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Um, and do we have any other questions at this time about the energy assistance? Not seeing any in queue. Okay. All right, so. Oh, it actually looks like one just popped up if you want to take another question. Yeah, yeah, let's definitely take that question. Go ahead, John. Like, did a question pop up or, or no? Are we moving on? Yeah. Yeah. You'll make sure uh, you're unmuted on your device also. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just kind of wanted to um, continue on with, uh, with uh, Alva's question. Um, so um, I, I was interested on when the uh, what the sequence of this EA um, program would uh, would look like. 
Um, you, you guys mentioned in the proposal that you guys would use all of uh, supply as well as ABC uh, before um, before utilizing this EA program. So my question is, um, wondering I'm wondering if our RDRs going to be dispatched before um, this takes into effect, and also our, will RDRs also be counted in the RSC um, and 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 then the and would Kaiso fail um, first um, with RDRs before this is taken into account? So, uh, could provide some clarification on that. And, and who's like speaking? To to that, John? Yeah, I just want to know who is speaking real quick, and then and then Danny, you can answer it. Yeah, this is John from SE. Okay, thanks, John. Go ahead, Danny. Okay, thanks to both of you, Johns. Uh, so RDRR, John, would be dispatched to the extent that the bids are enabled in the market. I think the sequencing of how KISO as a BAA would use its emergency supply, which RDRR is classified as, as well as a lot of the outside of emergency supply, is still something that we're working to formalize. Uh, as you are aware, uh, recently, but we've had additional procurement of outside of the market supply. So one of our uh, objectives this fall is to actually try to sequence this and formalize how it would all be used. I would expect the results of that would likely have RDRR be enabled in the market to the extent that its use limited run times doesn't exacerbate reliability issues uh, through potentially net peak. Uh, that would be in place and ideally would be considered uh, within the RSE prior to uh, a failure of the RSE and then the necessity of assistance energy transfers. Okay, no, thanks for the clarification. So just to kind of um, continue on this, um, so if let's just say RDRs are considered, so does that mean that, um, that EA would be in effect um, after an EA2 is declared because RDRs are, are actually, the only time RDRs are used is during a, a EA2 declaration. So. so that's a little misconception that I think I can help clarify. The KISO actually can, can enable the bids into the market for RDRR once we enter into any phase of an emergency. So that goes from emergency warning up through an EEA3. What you're highlighting is that when they're actually dispatched, we would enter into an EEA2. So uh, to the extent they're in an emergency, the operators don't think that enabling them into the market would have any knock-on reliability risks due to that limited runtime. They could be considered within the RSE prior to the KISO entering into an EEA2. Okay, that's that's definitely good clarification. Is there is there somewhere in the tariff that points to that? Because I think that's um, a topic that a lot of uh, California LSCs are 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 interested in. Um, when RDRs get do get counted and and when it doesn't. So. Yeah, I I don't know if it's explicit in the tariff. I'm not the subject matter expert nor, nor attorney on the the DR sections of our tariff. I would refer you to our OP4420. I think that summarizes a lot of our emergency procedures, and that is ultimately where I think we will look to more formalize uh, how these products could be used uh, going forward as we undertake this process this fall. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you, John. And, um, and Danny, you know, we may want to think about, you know, is it necessary to have an ISO corollary to this release of ABC? Um, because, you know, essentially that's what we're asking. WIM entity VAA, you know, we have the, the release of the ABC prior to the, um, you know, triggering of this uh, energy assistance transfer. So anyway, we, we should think about that. and. Um, and, and see if there's any more uh, elaboration in the tariff here anyway, in terms of this proposal needed to clarify that point. Uh, 
All right, any other questions at this time? I do not see any in queue. Okay. Well, um, with that then, I think we can um, scroll on down and now we're into section 34 of the tariff. So uh, Isabel is sort of blasting through the, the prioritization of, of, of uh, curtailments for low and high priority exports. And uh, what we have done in, in as part of this proposal, and this ties back to the accounting uh, of uh, low priority exports that may be curtailed in the resource efficiency evaluation, I've added a new section, the section 34 of the tariff, which is the, um, the, the, the market operation, uh, real-time market operation provisions of the tariff. And, and we've added um, a section to account for uh, operator intervention in order to implement the the priorities established through the through the tariff, which have recently been clarified through the loads exports wheelings uh, initiative, uh, and so we've reflected that here. And so the these um these uh, mechanisms are aligned with what exists in the table above in this section 34. So we published that for you here as well. It's all part of the same section. So you can reference that. But in essence, what this does is it says that after after the HASC, the, the KISO operations can intervene in, in and ensure uh, the curtailment of these lower priority exports uh, in, in, in the real time in order to uh, facilitate the implementation of the priorities that are established above. And this is really because we're we're, we're, this is after the market is, is run and the market is done what it's done. So now the only way to, to implement this is through operator intervention. And then, like I said, this, this, is, this is the mechanics of it. And then the reflection of this is, is in the resource efficiency evaluation up above in section 29.34, uh, the corollary in the WEIM to the real-time operations uh, section 34. So um, with that, uh, I think I'll see if Danny or anybody on the ISO has any further clarifications and we'll open it up for questions. I do see one caller in queue, so let's go to Allison. Hi, thank you. This is Allison Mates with Bonneville. Um, I saw a question to the last sentence on there, the scheduling coordinator for any export schedule. Um, must submit an e-tag with the designation of firm provisional. So is that referring to, um, it, it, is that a change for other uh, exports? I know we talked about the LPT exports um, awarded in half. Is that all A, B, and C above would be covered by that change to the designation of firm provisional on the e-tag? I guess I can be more clear. I'm trying to figure out if it's a change for how we tag um, economic exports. No, it's, it's, well, it's to clarify that those enumerated A, B, and C uh, uh, exports priority schedules, you know, lower priority schedules must be uh, tagged uh, with the um, firm provisional designation so that we can, uh, we can differentiate the, the tags in the real time and, and, and make sure we we are, you know, appropriately implementing uh, the, the Yeah, John, uh, so go ahead. A, A, A includes uh, economic, real-time economic hourly bid export schedules. Okay, so those would, would use the firm provisional tagging as well. Yes, my and, 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 and C, and C, C includes um, everything else. Expo economic exports that originally cleared the day ahead market that are now self schedules uh, okay. in real time. Well, they become LPTs, I guess, in real time. Hallie, it's almost easier to think of it from the other direction that 
firm exports would be would qualify as PT exports under our current rules, and everything else that exports from the CAISO would be an LPT from a tagging perspective. Or, or everything else is an LPT, which then uh, would be a GFT from a tagging perspective. Okay, so everything below the firm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And any other questions online? Yeah, let's go to Matt Connolly. Hey, this is Matt from pg and &E. Thanks for the chance to ask a question. I wanted to focus on the language uh, related to the EEA level. I see here that you've indicated it's an EEA-3. Um, in the last stakeholder call, I thought there was a comment made that, that CAISO actually intended it to be an EEA-2, and just was wondering if that could be clarified here. So, Danny, I, I, in our discussions, we had pegged it at an EEA-3 because it was to prevent arming of firm load or shedding of firm load. So, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I, I think the idea here is when we would arm firm load to backfill reserves and release them for energy, we would be in, the, in EEA-3, and we would look to initiate these curtailments if necessary prior to taking that operational action. So I think we can clarify that. Okay, so so what I'm hearing then, and we can fix this and, and we'd welcome your your comment, uh, is to, it would be we're actually in an EEA-2 trying to prevent us from going to an EEA-3 or are we, are we in an EEA-3? Yeah, I think we would look to do this before we moved into an EEA-3. Okay. All right, well, that, that it would be helpful if you just put that in your comment and we'll track that and, and correct that and uh, adjust that accordingly. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that, Matt. Thanks for the clarification. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So then I am going to move over to next steps. So let me stop sharing here. Okay, so for next steps, um, we will be taking comments on the draft tariff language. Those comments will be due September 27th and we will post a template to the initiative web page out on the website here in the next day or two. Um, and then as far as a next iteration of a proposal, um, we are targeting uh, September 26th to publish the final proposal and then the October 26th joint governance meeting um, for board approval. And then again, uh, June 1, 2023 implementation. Um, and I see Alva just raised his hand again, so Alva. Yeah, actually, I was going to join in on that. Um, I just wanted to, um, I think this is what we said, but, uh, you know, we think of like when, when like an EEA-2 is declared, certain steps are taken. And this is uh, what you're specifying here is a little different, and so I think it should be kind of defined as, in a, in a sense, you're at the end of the EEA-2 process, and you're about to go into the EEA-3 process. It's almost like a transitional state um, because you're saying it's something you're going to do just prior to having to go into an EEA-3. So that we, we'd had some discussion about that internally, and that was why I think the question seemed, seemed relevant to us. And a, any clarification you can introduce into the tariff I think will be useful because otherwise it seems that you have the discretion to curtail exports as soon as you declare an EEA-2 which is a, happens much more frequently, I think, than the, the situation you're talking about. That's a, that's a fair point, Alba. And please, yeah, put that in the comments, and I'll I'll, I'll leave it to Danny and, and Brad and others to reflect, you know, the collective understanding in the final proposal. 
and we'll take the comments on the on the tariff here and then the the final proposal and we'll update the draft tariff language and probably get that <clears throat> published um, with uh, you know sometime between the the you know the final proposal and the uh, and the board uh, meeting um, and we may have to wrap up the tariff after that October decision um, but uh, you know to get it on file fairly soon after that with the June 1 implementation target so um, yeah we'll, we'll definitely work that into the tariff as appropriate and you'll have a full opportunity to see that and and comment on that um, and both in the you know final proposal and then and then a reflection of the final proposal in the in the in the draft tariff language before before that's uh, filed so I hope that helps. Okay, thank you much appreciated And my next slide here um, just is a direct link to the initiative webpage um, and then has that comment deadline as well of September 27th. And then my last reminders for today, um, we are hosting the 2022 Stakeholder Symposium this year on November 9th and 10th in downtown Sacramento at the Safe Credit Union Convention Center. So if you have not registered for that event, I encourage you to do so. You can register by going to the ISO website at kaiso.com. And then again, you'll go to that Stay Informed tab, and then you'll see the Stakeholder Symposium page linked there. Um, you can register there. And then in addition to registration, we are offering sponsorship opportunities. Um, so if you are interested in sponsoring the 2022 Stakeholder Symposium, uh, you can find more information on that same Stakeholder Symposium page. So with that, I'll just open it up for any last minute questions before we conclude. Okay. Not seeing any, um, then that wraps up today's stakeholder call. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day.